our last speaker today is Hugh Owen. He is director of the Colbe Centre for the Centre of Creation, based in Virginia, in the United States. It provides a forum for Catholic theologians, philosophers, natural scientists, and others. The Centre seeks to educate people, particularly in the Catholic Church, about the truth of creation as revealed in sacred scripture and sacred tradition, and as confirmed by modern science. His, his, presentation, his presentation is entitled, Adam and Eve, Mystical Saints and Doctors of the Church. The floor is yours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's a great joy to be here. And what I'm going to share today is the essential content of a paper that was published in the Proceedings of a Conference that the Kolbe Center held jointly with Human Life International in Rome just before the second session of the Synod on the Family. And uh, the purpose of the symposium was to defend the traditional teaching of the Church on the creation of Adam and Eve as the foundation of holy marriage. Um, I'm not going to have time to do more than speak about one topic, which is the testimony that we find in the writings of the mystical saints and doctors of the church to the special creation of Adam and Eve. If you want more information about the theological, philosophical, and natural science evidence that supports this beautiful doctrine, you can go to the conference website, uh, www.romansymposium.com, you can find all the papers there for free download. You can also go to the Colbe Center website, uh, www.colbecenters, center spelled the wrong way, dot O-R-G, <laughs> and you can find many, many articles in theology, philosophy, and natural science that defend the whole traditional doctrine of creation. Before we get started, I just want to uh, put in a, a, wor a good word for some materials that you could obtain here before you leave. This book entitled, My Journey into the Light of God's Love, is the testimony of a woman who was brought up uh, in Shia Islam in Iran, who converted to the Catholic faith. And this is a very beautiful and important book. And when you read this book, you'll discover that the thing that really attracted this woman to the Catholic faith more than anything else was the true teaching of the church on holy marriage. That was the decisive turning point in her life when she realized what this was and that the Islamic teaching on marriage could not be from God. So you can obtain this book from the FL, FLI table. Um, this little booklet, If You Believed Moses, You Would Believe Me, gives a very short defense of the traditional teaching of the church on creation and addresses the scientific evidence that supposedly proves that evolution is a fact that only a fool would deny. And we show that that simply is not the case in this little booklet. This book, uh, or booklet, Genesis Through the Eyes of the Saints, is a more elaborated version of what I'm going to present in this talk. So if you want more of the details, you can get all of these items from the FLI table. I'd also like to put in a plug for Daylight Magazine. Um, Daylight Magazine has been doing a great service to the Catholic community all over the world by defending the traditional teaching of the church on creation for many years. And as most of you know, it's published here in the UK and Anthony Nevard is here who directs this organization. 
And uh, they publish this excellent little magazine several times a year, so I encourage you to become a subscriber. If you'd like to become a subscriber to our free email newsletter, Anthony has a sign-up sheet at his table. All you have to do is neatly print your name and email address or your mailing address if you don't have email, and you'll be subscribed. Not very long ago, at the end of the 19th century, when the enemies of the church and of God launched the modern assault against holy marriage by trying to introduce divorce into Catholic countries where it was prohibited for everybody, Catholic or non-Catholic, to divorce, Pope Leo XIII wrote an encyclical on holy marriage to all the bishops. And in that encyclical, he told them that they must defend holy marriage on this foundation. And then he wrote these words. He said, we record what is known to all and cannot be denied by anyone that God on the sixth day of creation, having created Adam from the dust of the earth, formed a spouse for him from his side miraculously while he was locked in sleep. Now how did we get from a day not so long ago when the vicar of Christ on earth said that this is known to all and cannot be denied by anyone to a day when this is known to almost none of our children or grandchildren and denied by almost all of their teachers. You see, if this teaching of Pope Leo XIII had been consistently obeyed, we would not have the sexual anarchy and confusion that we have within the Catholic community today. Because it's really very simple. If you believe that God created one man for one woman for life from the beginning, that's all the sex education you need. And it is impossible to really become confused about the holiness of marriage, that it's a divine institution and not a social convention, or even about sexual morality if you simply believe this, which was handed down from the apostles and believed and taught by all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers in their authoritative teaching. But in the entire proceedings of the Synod and the Family, I don't believe I saw a single mention of this doctrine by any member of the hierarchy who made comments. I stand to be corrected, and I would love to be proven wrong if you can tell me something to the contrary. You see, when our Lord Jesus Christ gave the Great Commission, and he commanded us to go and teach all nations all that he had commanded us to teach, at the foundation of that all was a very clear doctrine about the creation of man in the universe. If you go through the first 11 chapters of the sacred history of Genesis, as the Catechism of Trent calls it, and you um, and you then go through the four Gospels, you'll find that every time our Lord speaks about anything in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, he always speaks of it as true history. We don't have time to go through all the verses. But for example, when in Mark chapter 10, our Lord speaks about Adam and Eve, he speaks of them as real people who were created in a state of perfect harmony at the beginning of creation, not 13.8 billion years after the beginning. And when he speaks about Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, he locates him at the foundation of the world, which is a phrase in the Holy Scriptures and in the Church Fathers that refers to the beginning of creation, not just to the beginning of human history. Even more importantly, Whenever our Lord worked one of his miracles, he always acted in the same way that he had acted in the beginning when with the Father and the Holy Ghost he spoke the heavens and the earth and all they contain into existence. And so when our Lord went to the tomb of Lazarus going on four days, a rotting corpse, 
And he said, come out! And in a split second, out came a fully functioning, breathing human being. Every believing Jew knew that this must be God in the flesh. Because every believing Jew knew that what the psalmist said was true. He spoke and it was made. He commanded and it stood forth. So just as God in the beginning had taken matter and by fiat, by willing it, made the perfect man Adam, body and soul, so that same God must be walking the earth who could say to disorganized matter of a rotting corpse, come out and raise it up by his fiat, by his word, a fully functioning, breathing human being. But our Lord also said something very important to the Pharisees. He said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote of me. But if you do not believe Moses, how shall you believe my words? That's pretty clear. And the teaching of the church has always been very clear, as summed up by Pope Leo XIII in Providentissimus Deus, that the literal and obvious sense of Scripture must be believed unless reason dictates or necessity requires that we abandon it. And that is a very high burden of proof, which needless to say is never met, but it's often claimed that it is met without it really happening. All through the Bible, we find that we are told that Moses wrote from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And the fathers of the church were very clear that Moses not only wrote, when it came to Genesis 1, Moses wrote what God himself revealed to Moses. This is why St. John Chrysostom describes him as the prophet of the past. We know that prophets like Isaiah were shown things that happened far in the future. But what the fathers understood is God can also make Moses a prophet of the past. He could show Moses how he actually created the heavens and the earth and all they contain. And this is what the fathers taught, almost all of them. Moses made equal to the angels, being considered worthy of the sight of God face to face, reports to us those things which he heard from God. St. Ambrose, Moses spoke to God the Most High, not in a vision nor in dreams, but mouth to mouth. Plainly and clearly there was bestowed on him the gift of the divine presence. And so Moses opened his mouth and uttered what the Lord spoke within him. Well, a very strange thing happened after the so-called enlightenment got underway. There were all these new sciences that arose, and we were told by the leading intellectuals of various countries that these new sciences proved that what was written in the sacred history of Genesis wasn't really history after all. And this really got going with what is now known as the documentary hypothesis and the idea that Moses didn't actually write or redact or edit the first five books of the Bible even though all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers had always said that he did. And the basis for this was that the new science of archaeology did not find evidence of writing in the time of Moses, and therefore the scholars made a very logical inference. If there was no writing in the time of Moses, Moses couldn't have written anything, therefore the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers were wrong. Now, these scholars who quickly gained the allegiance of most of academia in Europe and North America at the end of the 19th century, they had other arguments. They said, look, there are no kings in Israel in the time of Moses, and yet he's talking about kings. That's obviously an anachronism. That points to the fact that this must have been written later on. And then the author of Genesis talks about camels being domesticated in the time of Abraham. They said, look, we haven't found any archaeological evidence that camels were domesticated in that period, so that's another anachronism. And then this author or authors, whoever they are, talk about the Philistines. But for heaven's sake, the Philistines were not a big military power in the time of Moses. So they said, it's, it's obvious 
that Moses could not possibly have written or redacted the first five books of the Bible shortly after the events in Exodus and Deuteronomy took place. But let's just stop for a moment and ask ourselves this question. What would be the proper attitude of a Catholic scholar when confronted with this evidence? Would we say, well, reason now dictates and necessity requires that we recognize that Jesus didn't really mean what he said or he was wrong when he said Moses wrote of me? No. Because the burden of proof has not been met. And so a faithful Catholic scholar at the end of the 19th century would not accept this Wellhausen documentary hypothesis, no matter how many of his respected friends in academia were doing so. Because he would say, I think we better wait. And I think we better see whether when all the evidence comes in, whether perhaps our Lord Jesus Christ didn't actually say the truth when he said that Moses wrote of him. And sure enough, those faithful Catholic scholars have been thoroughly vindicated because over the years, archaeologists have found abundant evidence not only of writing in the time of Moses, but writing more than 1,000 years before the time of Moses. So the whole rotten foundation for this arrogant hypothesis was totally destroyed a long time ago. The problem is, like so many false hypotheses, including the global warming scam, these hypotheses take on a life of their own. And even after the foundations are destroyed, intelligent people can come up with all kinds of ways to finesse the facts and make them fit in to what has lost its foundation. And that's what happened. But as scholars have delved into the Hebrew text of the Pentateuch, they have discovered many things which completely refute this bogus claim that Moses did not write or redact the Pentateuch. For one thing, what is the first prophecy in the Holy Scriptures of the coming of the Messiah? Anyone? Genesis 3.15, exactly. God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. But then, is it he will crush your head? Is it she will crush your head? Or is it it will crush your head? Because you see, the pronoun in the Hebrew text is an unusual one. It's called an epicene personal pronoun. It has no gender. So the only way you can know the correct translation is if you're a Catholic. Because the Bible alone will not give it to you. And so we are privileged to know that St. Jerome gave us the correct translation when he said, Ipsa contra it. She will crush your head. But here's another interesting thing. This epicene personal pronoun is only found in the first five books of the Bible. Now, if the first five books of the Bible were really not written or redacted by Moses, then why do they have a very unusual form that isn't found anywhere else in the Old Testament. Doesn't make any sense. That is, unless you believe that our Lord Jesus Christ actually was right when he said, Moses wrote of me. But there's more. Scholars have also discovered that the first five books of the Bible are full of Egyptian loan words, words that are brought in to the Hebrew language from Egyptian like the name Moses, for example. Now, why would the first five books of the Bible, far more than any other books in all of Scripture, be full of words that were brought into the Hebrew language from Egyptian? Could it have something to do with the fact that Moses was educated in the court of Pharaoh and that Egyptian was practically his mother tongue? So you see... Our Lord Jesus Christ turns out to have been right after all. Wouldn't it have been a good idea for our scholars to humble themselves and put more faith in the Word of God 
than in the word of man. Now, of course, people today will say, well, even if Moses did write the sacred history of Genesis, he didn't have all of our scientific knowledge. He couldn't have understood all the complexities of evolutionary theory. So, of course, God had to give him this nice myth. Well, it's easy to prove that that's false because here's the icon of human evolution. And the only thing, as we like to say, that is scientific about this is the McDonald's man. Because that is the only thing that actually corresponds to reality, sadly. The rest of it has no basis in real natural science, in any branch of natural science. But the point I'm trying to make is that you don't need to know anything about natural science to understand what this icon is saying. You do not need to know that 1 plus 1 equals 2, and you can understand perfectly well what this icon is saying. So the idea that Moses and the ancients were too stupid or too simple to understand evolution is preposterous. If this is what God did, he could have shown this to Moses in a vision, and then Genesis 1 would be telling us how God took a fish and turned it into an amphibian, and then he said, let there be a reptile, and there was a reptile, and then he said, let there be a bird. The reason we don't see this is because this is a fantasy that was invented by arrogant, proud human beings who could not accept that there are some things that we actually cannot work out for ourselves by extrapolating from our very limited realm of experience in a fallen world. All the fathers and doctors of the church believed and taught from the beginning that God created all the different kinds of creatures by fiat, by willing them into existence instantly and immediately, not using any kind of material process. All of them taught that God created Adam, body and soul, a special creation, and that he literally created Eve from Adam's side, and he placed them as the king and queen of a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe. All of them also taught then that it was the original sin that brought not only human death, but disease and deformity into this world. These things, according to all the fathers and doctors, did not exist in the first created world. They were introduced after the original sin. Now, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is the way that certain saints and even doctors of the church were given by God himself private revelations in which they were shown different elements of the sacred history of Genesis to confirm the faith of all the members of the mystical body of Christ in this beautiful doctrine. In the Byzantine tradition, we have a number of well-loved saints who were taken into paradise. Paradise is a real place. It is not a myth, and it did not cease to exist after Adam and Eve were expelled. In fact, if you read the fathers, they say that Adam and Eve could see paradise. And according to one tradition, Adam wept every day of his life for 963 years, partly because he was always reminded of what they had lost by his original sin. So, in the tradition of the church, we have certain saints who were taken to paradise and who describe the incredible beauty of that place and how even the trees, the plants, seem to, to be in a state that hovers between corruptibility and incorruptibility. St. Simeon, the new theologian, is considered to be one of the doctors of the Eastern Church who sums up the whole tradition of the Eastern Fathers. And it's widely believed among Eastern Catholics and Orthodox Catholics that he gives this teaching not just 
repeating what was handed to him from other fathers, but because God showed him the work of creation. And so he teaches, God did not, as some people think, just give paradise to our ancestors at the beginning, nor did he make only paradise incorruptible. Before paradise, he made the whole earth, the one we inhabit and everything in it. Nor that alone, but he also in five days brought the heavens and all they contain into being. On the sixth day, he made Adam and established him as Lord and King of all visible creation. Neither Eve nor paradise were yet created, but the whole world had been brought into being by God as one thing, as a kind of paradise, at once incorruptible, yet material and perceptible. St. Hildegard of Bingen was made a doctor of the church by Pope Benedict XVI. And God showed her many things about the creation and present constitution of the universe. Pope Eugenius III personally investigated St. Hildegard's writings and utterances of a prophetic nature. And in a unique instance, to my knowledge, he, as pontiff, said that her private revelations were from God. A conviction that was shared also by their mutual friend, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. St. Hildegard is very clear about what God showed her. He showed her Adam and Eve created in a state of glory. In our Byzantine tradition, on the Feast of the Holy Transfiguration, we pray a remarkable prayer in which we say, O oh God, who restored on Mount Tabor the glory that was lost by Adam. So the glory that was revealed by our Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Tabor, according to that prayer, is the same glory or a similar glory that Adam and Eve had from the moment of their creation. It is truly tragic that most of our young people are taught in Catholic schools that Adam and Eve were conceived in the womb of a subhuman primate and that they were created in a sort of primitive state of consciousness. This teaching is not only utterly ignorant of the real scientific facts, it shows an astonishing contempt for the whole tradition of the Catholic Church. Because the reality is, as St. Hildegard was shown, Adam and Eve were created in a state of holiness so exalted that it was never attained again until our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary walked this earth. And when the original sin was committed by Adam, that glory was lost. And that is why they had to be clothed by Almighty God. But the Eastern Fathers also tell us something else that is food for thought. St. John of Damascus, for example, who's considered the greatest of the Eastern doctors, teaches that when God brought the animal skins to Adam and Eve to clothe them, he was not only clothing their nakedness, which was now revealed for the first time. He was also telling them that death had now come to the animals because it is the teaching of every father except one that there was no animal death before the original sin of Adam. St. Bridget was made a doctor of the church by Pope St. John Paul II. But she teaches clearly, categorically, that the entire creation was created by acts of the divine will, not through any kind of material or gradual process as theistic evolutionists hold. And in the beautiful liturgy of St. Bridget, which is still prayed by Bridgetine religious all over the world, she tells us that God created the entire universe so beautiful so harmonious, so complete for our first parents that there is only one thing that is more beautiful than this universe when it came forth from God. Can you guess what it is? 
the Blessed Virgin herself. That is written in the liturgy of St. Bridget. And we need to understand that the Immaculate Conception is not only a doctrine that saves us from the errors of Protestantism with regard to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is also the, the doctrine that can save us from the error of theistic evolution. Because just as we would take great offense if someone came into this hall and said, God made the Blessed Virgin like another woman. She had her defects. We would be incensed and we would refuse to accept that. But someone can come into any, almost any school, any Catholic school or parish in Europe and North America, almost, and say, God used a process of hundreds of millions of years of death, deformity, disease, and struggle for existence. And most of us just nod our heads and say, oh yes, I guess, I guess he did. I guess that's what all the scientists think. But St. Bridget would have rent her garments if someone dared to suggest that the God who created the Blessed Virgin Mary created a world full of death, deformity, and disease. At the very beginning of the so-called Enlightenment, the Mother of God herself came to the Spanish religious, Venerable Maria Vagreda, and Almighty God told her, in this time of unprecedented darkness, darkness, not enlightenment, I'm giving you my mother as your last hope. And what does the Queen of Heaven do? She tells Venerable Maria Bagreda, for whom we in America have a special love because she bilocated to what is now the United States 500 times to teach the Native American Indians the faith. So she prepared them so well, they showed up to the priests who had never seen them before and they knew their catechism. And this holy woman tells us in a work that was praised by many popes and many great saints that Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin told her that Almighty God showed her the work of creation just as he had showed it to Moses. He showed her the six days of creation exactly as they had been shown to Moses before her. And with regard to Adam, just as God showed the glorious state of Adam, perfect in body, mind, and soul at his creation, so God showed to Venerable Maria Vagreda that Adam was so much like our Lord Jesus Christ that as far as their bodies were concerned, they looked like twins. Blessed Anna Catherine Emmerich was another very gifted mystic, beatified very recently. And Jesus Christ told her that he had given her more detailed knowledge of the past than any other mystic who had ever lived. And what does he show her? He shows her the same things that he showed to St. Hildegard and Venerable Maria and St. Bridget that all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers believed and taught from the beginning of the church. He created Adam, body and soul, a special creation, and he created Eve from Adam's side. Now the devil has always hated this doctrine because if you teach this doctrine to little children, as the Blessed Virgin taught the little children in Nazareth for sure, they know that our God is all good, almighty, and all wise. And the devil doesn't want anybody to believe that. What the devil always wants is to make us doubt the goodness and trustworthiness of our God. Isn't that how he began with Eve? Did God really say? Because once he gets us to doubt God's word, as it has been believed in the church from the beginning, he can get us to do anything he wants. 
And so, in one of the most remarkable prophetic passages in the entire Bible, St. Peter in the first century predicted the evolution deception. He says, in the latter days, in the future, scoffers will come. And they're going to say, things have always been the same from the beginning of creation. But that's a lie. Because what all these doctors that I've quoted from taught, and what all the fathers and doctors taught, is that God created everything for Adam and Eve. And when he finished creating Adam and Eve, he stopped creating new kinds of creatures. That is why the Sabbath was introduced as the central liturgical ritual of the Jewish people to commemorate the fact that God created everything by fiat, made a perfectly beautiful and complete creation, and then stopped creating new kinds of creatures. So that the natural order, what we are living in, didn't begin according to the apostles, fathers, and doctors until the work of creation was finished. So you can't extrapolate no matter how smart you are, no matter how much technology you have, you can't extrapolate correctly from this natural order back to the beginning. Look what St. Peter goes on to say. These people will have to deliberately ignore the fact, not the belief, the fact that it was the word of God that brought the heavens and the earth and all they contain into existence, not some kind of evolutionary process. And then he says they're also going to deny that there was a global flood which so completely changed the face of the earth and incidentally gave rise to the one ice age that you can't even know what the earth looked like before the flood by looking at it the way it is today. And that's what real science confirms. And it's another reason why the global warming theorists are completely off the rails because they don't recognize the most important geological event in the history of the world. And 95% of the Catholic scientists who were cited this morning believed in this doctrine. Only a tiny percentage of them accepted the evolutionary deception. Now, this is not only what God revealed to the great mystical doctors and saints. This is what was taught by the most sober of all the doctors and fathers of the church. In the Summa, St. Thomas tells us that the first perfection of the world was when it was complete with the creation of Adam and Eve and all the different kinds of creatures existed together with them, each one perfect according to its nature and all in perfect harmony at the beginning of creation. And so St. Thomas beautifully sums up the teaching of all the fathers and doctors who went before him and who came after him, that in this world, in the works of nature that we observe, creation does not enter, but is presupposed to the work of nature. Therefore, according to this principle, natural scientists should study what is going on here and now. They're supposed to study the natures of things in this natural order. They are not supposed to try to extrapolate from this order of things all the way back to the beginning. Does everyone see that? This is the error that has confounded most of our intellectuals today. And as Aristotle taught a long time ago, and St. Thomas repeats it, a small error in the beginning becomes a very big error later on. So you could be the smartest person in the world, you could even be virtuous, and yet if your starting point is that it's legitimate to extrapolate from the, this natural order all the way back to the beginning to explain how everything came to be, as Monsignor Lemaitre thought that it was, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how much technology you have, you will get it wrong every time. Your premise, your starting premise, has to be right in order for you to reason to a correct conclusion. And here's where everything started to go wrong in a big way. 
Rene Descartes was the first baptized Catholic scoffer to hold that it was more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature, like plants or animals or even stars, in terms of the same natural processes that are going on now than by this silly idea that things just popped into existence in the beginning. Now, maybe it's not a coincidence that before Descartes proposed this wonderful new idea, he dabbled in Rosicrucianism, the occult, holed himself up in an apartment in Amsterdam in a free-thinking country, the Netherlands, and had three mystical dreams in which he said an angel of truth came to him and showed him this wonderful new way of thinking that would change the way everybody thought. I wonder who that angel of truth might have been. Because you see, the angel of truth, alias Lucifer, not only got Descartes to believe several lies, he got him to believe and teach several things that are the opposite of the truth. Because Descartes was deceived into believing that we can extrapolate from the present natural order all the way back to the beginning of creation, he formulated the, pre the premise implicitly, if not explicitly, that the present is the key to the past, and that is the foundation of every system of evolutionary thought, whether it's theistic or atheistic. And it's wrong. Because the reality is, since the work of creation was a fiat creation, if we want to understand the present, we have to understand the past as God revealed it to us. The past, as revealed by God, is the key to the present. But ask the educated Catholics you know, do you think it's reasonable to extrapolate from the things that we observe in nature now all the way back to the beginning, the moment of the Big Bang? I guarantee you, unless you have a very special circle of friends, or unless you only associate with innocent little children who know better, that 95 plus percent of your educated Catholic acquaintances and friends will say, yes, of course, that's reasonable. Isn't that what natural science is all about? No, it is not. And when we return to the traditional doctrine of creation, we will have a golden age of natural science. Blaise Pascal, a contemporary of Descartes, was every bit as great a genius. But unlike Descartes, he truly loved our Lord Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. And he saw the terrible harm that this error would do if it were ever widely accepted. And so he wrote in Pensée, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God. But he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with the flip of his thumb, the Big Bang. After that, he had no more use for God. Now, my time is running out, so I'm just going to give you one out of many, many examples we could give, and we give more examples in this little booklet, and we have many more examples on our website, of how the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation is confirmed by reasonable extrapolations from what we observe in the present, and how the fairy tale of evolution is completely contradicted by any reasonable extrapolation. The problem is that our children and grandchildren are given unreasonable extrapolations and made to believe that they're reasonable. So here's the example. We are told in the sacred history of Genesis by Moses, and by the way, in the early 20th century, the Pontifical Biblical Commission was an arm of the magisterium. And Pope St. Pius X decreed that anyone who descended from any of its decisions was guilty of grave sin. Those decrees have never been abrogated. Now, many theologians will say, well, they're not binding on us anymore. We've set them aside. Ask them to show you where the magisterium of the church has abrogated those decrees. They will not be able to do it. And the PBC, I believe in 1906, ruled that you should not contest the Mosaic authorship or editorship of the first five books of the Bible. So Moses tells us, that after the Noachic flood, there were 
eight people who survived. And for the last 400 years, we've been collecting uh, information from historical records on population growth. So we know that over those 400 years, in spite of wars and famines and all kinds of terrible things that have happened, the average annual growth rate for the population is 0.456 per year. Now with a simple calculation, you can take the initial population of eight people and take a realistic population growth rate, which has been observed over a period of 400 years, and multiply it by 4,500 years, which is the amount of time that the Masoretic text, which was pre preferred by St. Lawrence of Brindisi and all the great post-Tridentine doctors of the church, and lo and behold, you arrive at 6.5 billion people in the year 2000. <laughs> right on the money, practically. But if you look in a typical biology textbook, like the one authored by um, Professor Raven, who is a distinguished member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, our children and grandchildren are told that there was an initial human population of 500,000 people, I'm sorry, of two people, excuse me, 500,000 years ago. And if we make a simple calculation, we end up with a number so large that it is absolutely beyond taking seriously. So what is reasonable is the sacred history of Genesis. What is completely unreasonable is the fairy tale of evolution. And this brings us to our conclusion. St. Bernard summed it up so beautifully, I couldn't do any better. <laughs> said, he said something of Abelard that we could say of any theistic evolutionist today. While he professes to explain all things pertaining to creation in this case by reason, what is more contrary to reason than through reason to seek to soar above reason, which is what the work of creation is? And what is more contrary to faith than to refuse our belief to that which we cannot attain by reason? If you look back over the history of the church, the recent history of the last few hundred years, all the wonder workers of our church who raised the dead, who gave sight to the blind, who, like Venerable Antonio, converted 80,000 people to the Catholic faith. Do you know what these two wonder workers read? Every day they meditated on the mystical city of God. And with all their hearts, they believed this beautiful doctrine of creation. And because they believed that God, by his word, created the heavens, the earth, and all they contain, they could say to the blind, see in the name of Jesus Christ. To the dead, rise in the name of Jesus Christ. To the deaf, hear in the name of Jesus Christ. And they did. And I would like to ask you to reflect. Where are the wonder workers today? Besides St. Padre Pio, who believed in this doctrine, where are they? <coughs> when we believe again what the great wonder workers believed, then God will once again be able to work wonders. There has never been a successful evangelization in the history of the Catholic Church without wonders being worked. But wonders are never worked unless there is the faith whole and entire. And this man has done more to destroy the faith of most of our people in the true doctrine of creation than anybody else. So I have to leave you with this. The Blessed Virgin has given us a very important promise that in the end... All of this will pass away. Her Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to her by name. Russia will be converted, and an era of peace will be granted to the world. And in that era of peace, people will look back on these times in utter amazement 
if they don't try to forget this time as a nightmare, that people who called themselves Catholic could ever have abandoned the fundamental doctrine of creation that was handed down from the apostles. In the upper corner of the slide is a photograph of a Russian Orthodox priest whom I heard speak in Moscow in 2005, who founded a very successful evangelization movement in the Orthodox world on the foundation of the true doctrine of creation and showing the errors of the pseudoscience that's used to support it. In his one little parish in Moscow, he had 200 Muslims convert to Christianity. I don't think we had 200 conversions from Islam in the entire United States in the last 10 years. I could be wrong. When the consecration of Russia by name takes place, there will be such an explosion of grace that the whole world will be in awe of it. And that's why Padre Pio said once to a group of Americans, he said, when Russia converts, it will happen very fast. And Russia will be an example to you Americans of what it really means to repent, to convert, and follow God. Let us pray every day of our lives and ask all the children to pray for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Let us live our consecration to Jesus through Mary in every moment of our lives and pray that God will give the Holy Father the grace to do what Our Lady of Fatima asked. Our Lady of Fatima, spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What exactly are we bound by church teaching? And I mean strictly bound, rather than theological opinion. What are we strictly bound as Catholics to believe regarding regarding evolutionary theory in the age of the earth and special creation, I understand that we're in, we have to believe certain teachings like that to believe being actual human beings, real people, they're not just metaphors, but I understand there is some leeway as to how I to believe were created by God. Am I mistaken in this? No. Um, and if you want an expert opinion, you have to ask Father Crean to give you an expert opinion. But this is... This is our understanding within the Kolbe Center, that rightly expounded the dogmatic teaching of the Fourth Lateran Council, which was affirmed verbatim by the First Vatican Council, excludes theistic evolution. But it's not an explicit condemnation of evolution. Therefore, we believe that in the future, the magisterium of the church, perhaps in another council, will settle this matter once and for all. But until it does, we would be overstepping our bounds if we said that the church has defined that evolution is a heresy. We can't say that. What we can say, and if you read the materials that we've produced, I think we make a very strong case that if you interpret these dogmatic decrees that are de fide correctly, they really don't leave any room for theistic evolution. But as far as what we must hold, um, the best summary that I know of was given when the PBC, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, was an arm of the magisterium. And in 1909, the PBC ruled that no one, no one can withhold assent from the doctrine that God created all things from the beginning, which I think is rather restrictive when it comes to evolution, but people could argue that point. The special creation of Adam, which means body and soul, and the formation of Eve from Adam. So that's, I think, the points, those are the points where no Catholic really has any right to deviate. And we would argue that if we hadn't deviated from them, it wouldn't be necessary for Father Crean to be talking to us about the dangerous ambiguities in a recent apostolic exhortation. Where do the dinosaurs fit into your understanding? Um, they fit in beautifully. 
if you, if you um, go to our website, you can read an article on evidence for dinosaur and human coexistence. Um, if you go to our website, www.sciencevsversusevolution.org, you can find a scientific paper that's uh, the, the contents of which have been presented at several major geoscience conferences around the world, demonstrating that uh, dinosaur bones contain residual carbon-14, and that this has been proven to be the case consistently with multiple samples treated properly and tested at five different world-class laboratories. And this strongly indicates, as well as a whole ton of other evidence that I can't get into, but which is summarized in this little book, that the dinosaurs from which these bones were taken died thousands of years ago. In reality, as the little book explains, carbon-14 has been found in virtually every part of the so-called geological column. And this is not possible unless the entire contents of the geological column are only thousands of years old because carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years, and after 50,000 to 100,000 years, there won't be one single atom of carbon-14 left in the remains of any plant or animal. So in every area of natural science, real science confirms the sacred history of Genesis. But just try to go into a university, even a Catholic one, and share this information with students, and all the forces of hell will be unleashed against you because we've seen it again and again. When young people are taught this doctrine and shown how real science supports it, their faith is on a rock foundation. They can't be shaken. My wife and I have nine children. We have 14 grandchildren. Every one of them is practicing the faith. That is a miracle of grace. But my wife will be as quick as I to tell you if we did not teach our children this doctrine, we are convinced this would not be the case. We have one daughter who is already a nun. We have another daughter who is just entering the same abbey as to enter the postulancy to try her vocation. This would not have happened if we had not taught this beautiful doctrine to our children. Everywhere in the world we've been, and we've been on every continent except Antarctica, we see that the young people who keep the faith on this fundamental doctrine, they are solid, wonderful Catholics who could build a real civilization of love. But take away this foundation, and as the psalmist said, foundations destroyed. What can the just man do? What a wonderful way to finish. Yeah.